This week on the agenda, we're in Vienna for a conversation with the governor of Austria's central bank, Robert Holtzman. Governor Holtzman, thank you for having us here at Austria's central bank. Now, let's start with the good stuff. You know, growth in Austria is expected to pick up in the second half of the year. Where, where's that growth going to come from? Well, most of the growth is to come from tourism because this is the area where there is a, a possibility that much of the demand, which has been reduced in the past to make come in, uh, some of the demand will come from exports. Uh, if uh, uh, the uh, needs of other countries pick up, and both together should allow that we avoid uh, stagnation, in any case a recession, but we have a moderate growth this year, but we assume that growth will be higher and pick up again the, the years thereafter. You mentioned stagnation, and Aust Austria has been going through a period of stagnation. Inflation isn't coming down as fast as it is in, in other parts of the Eurozone. What's going on? Well, I think uh, that's uh, pretty normal that after a period of uh, turmoil, uh, what we had uh, with COVID, and now we still have a war nearby, it's uh, much closer than you think, uh, how to say, the borders of Ukraine are only some uh, 600 kilometers away. So this is a cause and effect of the economy that has been disrupted. And then also what is happening is that also the big locomotives of uh, international growth are, have also been a little bit of uh, uh, stammering. Uh, think about China and think about the US. Uh, so altogether, the world economy is currently driven by the emerging economies, sir. Uh, and uh, not by the advanced economies. But the way you're talking is in quite general terms. From that point of view, all of the Eurozone economies would have had the same effect. It's, it seems to be different in Austria. I don't think so. If you look into uh, Europe as a whole, uh, you have for uh, how to say, countries which are slightly above or slightly below the growth line, but you don't have major, major differences that you have some countries moving ahead, I don't know, with 3-4%, where those others have a major crash. I think uh, overall the growth development in Europe is not too different, but you have, uh, as always, uh, uh, local effects, and this is also happening here. So let's talk a little bit about those local effects. So, and for those who, who don't know, I suppose most Austrian exports are machines, vehicles, followed by some processed goods, you know, chemical products. It's all really energy intensive and I wonder if if the green transition is in a bit of a rut and if what we need is for that to pick up a bit before there's going to be really any real impact. Now you make a, a great point uh, I mean Austria a bit like Germany or the northern part of Italy is an industrial hub. Uh, industry has been uh, a major part of our growth for the last hundred and more years there. And this is the area which has been most hit by the increase in energy prices. And uh, in addition to this hit in energy prices, we have the need for a green transition, which requires all those additional investments. And this comes together then uh, with a reduction in, uh, in the national dynamism, what we have here. And uh, so this together leads that the growth in the industrial area is uh, uh, plus minus zero, but what we have is we have a sector which is tourism, uh, where we are, one of, we are one of the most intensive tourist uh, industries in the world, uh, where we had a growth, at least what we've seen for the summer, plus three above 2019, which is not bad. So I think that's an area where we will partly compensate, but the industrial sector is definitely something which uh, requires changes, in particular with regard to, you mentioned it there, what kind of energy will fuel it, or whether there's a need uh, to take some of the uh, energy-intensive industries out and put them somewhere else. So is the green transition in Austria moving fast enough? Uh, and, and if not, where would you like to see a little bit more momentum? 
Well, I would say the green transition has various issues. One of them is also in what direction should we move. My take is in order to get the, uh, the energy transition working, we need to be, think a little bit outside the box and not only how to say go into energy uh, transition uh, which is built on uh, sun and, uh, and winter and uh, which how to say the turbines and the uh, voltaic is imported from China. What you're saying is there's no one size fits all and what might be in fashion, you know, wind and solar, doesn't necessarily work for every economy. Uh, to some extent, yes, because wind and sun, uh, to say, produce it uh, when the sun is out and the wind is on. And if there's none of not here, how to say, you need to have a fallback position. And this fallback position, we have it to a large extent, which is water. So we have a lot of hydro energy in Austria, but we don't have for other mechanism besides uh, using the gas turbines and also I think uh, as a transition energy they're quite useful uh, because uh, it will take some time before the rest picks up. So I would love to see the energy uh, the energy part a bit more broad and not only uh, to wind and to sun because I think this would be too narrow. Okay, so let's move on to how to fix things. I, I, I like to discuss whether you think that monetary policy um, is in a good place. Um, when I spoke to the governor of the Bank of Greece ahead of the uh, ECB meeting in August, he thought that the 25 basis point rise would be enough, but you disagree, don't you? Well, it depends on the data we're going to see over the next days coming out there. Uh, and uh, what we have currently seen, if you think about the German data coming out yesterday, I just saw the first estimates about Austrian data, they unfortunately go in the other direction. So we have, how to say, a more re-increase in some of these indices, not a decrease. So it may be that, at least for some major parts of Europe, uh, the inflation may be more persistent than we would have loved to have it. And if this is the case, this is what they had conjectured. In this case, it would be advisable not to pause, uh, but uh, to continue with another 25% hike. The data we will see next week in detail, but the data we have so far confirmed my suspicion and explains why I thought we should not exclude a rise, but to have it as part of the uh, of the decision set when we meet uh, in two weeks down the road. And, and that further rise, w would that be it? Is it just one more that, that you need? Uh, I would say, as we don't know the future, we should not exclude it. But going to 4% would be important. Not only, how to say, uh, because it would be bring closer to where we are on the inflation rate, but also 4% sounds different than 3.75. So 4% is closer to 5 what the US had. So the 4% has a signaling effect beyond the 25%. And in my announcement over the recent months, uh, I had never excluded that the terminal rate would be above 4%. And uh, so perhaps I will get it. You've also said before that, that monetary policy strategies should not remain empty words, that the instruments must work, and not, not just sort of give hints and indications. Do they work? I think they work, but as always what we know is that our monetary instruments have a time lag of for at least half a year, particularly one to two years. So it's not something you press the button and things happen. Uh, and uh, we have moved uh, with the interest rate last summer, so it's only slightly more than 14 months or so that we have interest rate increase. Uh, we have uh, started uh, uh, to uh, repay back, so quantitative tightening has started in some areas, the, uh, the asset purchase program there, not in another. So there are many more instruments what we have. Currently, we used one well, but uh, we have other instruments which we have not yet fully used. This includes monetary tightening, an uh, example of the purchasing of the BEP, uh, the, the pandemic purchasing program. 
This would be another element where we should talk about when to reduce the outstanding volume there. So you're saying there are some tools that you, that you haven't used, but you know, doing too little is probably a bit bigger risk than, than, than doing too much. Ha, ha, has the ECB done too much? Not so far. I think uh, uh, when the question is so far in the past, extended uh, the balance sheet too much, -er. some people say so, I don't say, but now we have to bring this balance sheet, uh, which was uh, bumped up to almost nine trillion euros, I would say, has to be brought back. We had made major uh, progress in the area of the DELTRO, this uh, targeted uh, uh, credit programs uh, for the private sector and for households. This has been closed down by June and the rest of the uh, resources will be paid back soon. So we had stopped this one. We started uh, uh, with the interest rate increases. Uh, we stopped uh, one major purchase program, but we still continue to keep the other purchase program at the same level there. So we have made changes there, and I think uh, some of them needs to be strengthened. Why this purchase program? Why to uh, why to stop purchasing? Why perhaps to reduce it? Uh, they create liquidity, and as long as the liquidity is there. Uh, the monetary mechanism of interest rates is less effective than if there's less liquidity. It's a technical issue, but this explains why you not only have to think about the raising the rates, but we also have to reduce the liquidity. So if we are in the process of getting supply and demand back into balance, will additional interest rate rises be necessary to achieve that? Uh, this is only what we know afterwards, uh, but uh, I would claim that also we are close to the top, but we may not be there. And for this reason, as always, we have to be data driven. And for this reason, how to say, we will see how the developments throughout the euro area happens. And uh, this will uh, create a decision. I think uh, as the moment uh, where we are, it's important to keep uh, the options open to have uh, further interest rate right, uh, which may be one more 25, two more 25, perhaps not more, but we shouldn't exclude it. But you're worried about that 4% threshold? Exactly. The threshold, I think it's an important signaling device. Uh, why do you have it? Think about uh, uh, other countries uh, uh, where you have 4%, Australia and other places. So I think that's something which uh, matters. I mean, growth in the euro area ha has been there, but it's, it's been just incremental. I mean, how much of a risk is there that increasing interest rates is going to stifle that growth? Well, here both things come together. You need to interest rate uh, in order to calm the demand. Uh, if you have inflation, it is an excess uh, uh, supply uh, 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 compared uh, uh, to say in the excess demand what uh, what you have there and so we have to bring the demands down in order to extra supplies of money and the excess demand uh, for goods and as a result uh, uh, interest rates is one way of uh, dealing with it there. but the, 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 the critical part is that there, uh, uh, when you do this, you always run the danger that you reduce growth too much. But to some extent, you have to do it, because otherwise you would never get inflation back into the box. In which case, is there a possibility then, once you've crunched all the data, that there might be a Eurozone rate cut in the first half of next year? Well, we all hope so. I would say we, we don't increase the interest rate to keep them up there. Uh, we want to raise them to a level in which we think uh, we return to our interest rate target. And once this is in sight, then of course we can decrease the interest rates and uh, 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 some hope that it may happen only next year. Maybe a bit optimistic uh, in the US perhaps, uh, or by there, they also pushed it back now. But uh, to say, I do hope that latest in 25, we will have interest rate cuts there. And if we are back, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, inflation level, which is our target, 2%, and 
in this case, I would say we can go back uh, with the interest rate to the 2% uh, around uh, and not keep it at 4%. I want to talk about that 2% inflation target in a moment, but I wonder, is the ECB uh, taking its cues from, from other central banks around the world? You mentioned the United States before. You, have you got a keen eye on what the Fed are doing and how, to what extent is that then having an impact on what the ECB decides? Well, the dollar remains the most important currency in the world. Uh, Europe is only number second and the result of it, if you have a big brother, <coughs> who is uh, Everywhere, uh, it, it matters what they do. It's, and also what we know from our research is that uh, what the Fed does uh, has an impact on uh, our uh, uh, real and financial economy. And this is not uh, as of now, it always has been. So we look carefully what we're doing. But it, but it doesn't mean how to say that, uh, that we are dependent of the Fed. So we look what they're doing, we understand we have the argument. And this also has to do that the Fed in the recent past has always been in the financial cycle half a year, a year ahead of us. So if they did something, uh, we knew that uh, we will have a development which we uh, will be exposed to. So we can mimic to some extent some of the policy devices. And if you look back more recently, they started their interest rate hikes about half a year before we started them. So the Eurozone is always going to be playing catch-up with the United States? No, no, it's not catch-up. It's simply there may be moments when we are in the financial cycle in front. Uh, uh, but as we have seen for the time being, we are uh, behind it, which uh, may be natural part of it. Uh, and also other countries and uh, this we have to take into account. Still to come on the agenda, more from my interview with Robert Holtzman, Governor of Austria's Central Bank. We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas. A shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda from here in Vienna. Let's hear more from my interview with the Governor of Austria's Central Bank, Robert Holtzman. Let's talk about the inflation target, 2%. It seems more and more elusive. Is it time to reset and say it's unrealistic? Well, I know this opinion and I'm critical about this one because the 2 percenter is not something we imagined and then said, OK, let's try this one. 2% has been set to, uh, for a specific reason, it's above zero in order to allow um, a possibility for real wages to fall even if the in, uh, inflation target is, uh, is uh, uh, achieved there because it would uh, mean a decrease in the real wage with constant nominal wages. That's an important mechanism because Wages play a major role on the inflation parser. And uh, 2% is not too high, so if you accumulate 2%, it still means uh, uh, a real loss, but it's a small one. If you increase an inflation target to 3 or 4%, then the loss you have with it, the loss in purchasing power, is increasing very, very much more over a, a period. And this would always lead to major struggles and distributional fights. So 2%, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good measure. Uh, Even though higher inflation seems to be the new normal? No, it's not. It has happened now. We have uh, had inflation rate of uh, below 2% for a long time. We had the question of, uh, uh, of uh, deflation, not the inflation. We have uh, inflation rate now. I think 2% is, uh, is uh, a target uh, which uh, should be kept uh, because the alternatives are questionable, dangerous, uh, and also may reduce the wish to do something on the monetary side. 
has the cells 3%, 4%, 5% is okay. And this, how to say, what uh, leads to a major destabilization of uh, many of the economic uh, foundations we are based on. And speaking about some of the, those foundations, let, let's talk about the impact all of this is having on borrowing costs. You know, interest rate rises, making borrowing so much more expensive. Uh, this is true, but uh, if you go back, 4% uh, of uh, interest rate, uh, uh, market interest rate we had uh, in the beginning of the zero, so 2005, which is not too far away. We had it before, so uh, this interest rate, uh, and uh, if you talk to people a bit older, they tell, well, the first, I don't know, motorbike I bought when the interest rate was 12%, 15%, so 4% seems high after many years of uh, zero percent. Uh, yeah. uh, but Will we ever go this, back to those pre-pandemic historical lows, where I it's hope, so cheap to borrow? I hope not, <laughs> because uh, uh, if you have uh, such a low interest rate, uh, it means that you have a problem with, the, with your economy. Because if you have an interest rate uh, which is close to zero, uh, which means that if this were to be an equilibrium, which was means you would have a, a very low uh, productivity growth. And this would be much more destabilizing. So the zero interest rate, what we had with a negative uh, interest rate, was an anomaly. I hope we will never come back. Or bite, uh, uh, it's not excluded. Let's talk about some potential flashpoints in, in the global economy. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a banking crisis about to happen. We had SVP, we had you know, Credit Suisse. Um, it's been played down, but it's been a very bumpy ride for the banking sector. Is it a, is it a big problem waiting to happen? Not really. I know we had to we had, yes, the Silicon Valley Bank and we had the Credit Suisse Bank there. Uh, but in both cases, it had less to do with uh, the financial sector as such. It had to do that in both cases they had business bought, uh, bad business models. So not bad banking, but bad business. In which case, where are the things that you've got an eye on? You think, gosh, we need, we need to, to make sure that that doesn't blow up. I see more the question is with the um, public debt. I to say uh, over the different crises, uh, public debt uh, on average has always increased uh, worldwide. Uh, so it applies to the industrialized world, to the global north, but it also applies uh, to the global south. And uh, it was easy when the interest rate was low, but if it becomes higher and uh, uh, positive in real term, then how to say it begins to bite. Then you have to use your resources to pay it back. And this is where we are at the moment. And so a number of countries uh, 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 are at this dangerous position where uh, public debt matters. And so they become constrained in what of kind uh, policy can do. Think about Japan, where uh, the 250 percent of public debt are uh, a restriction a little bit on how much the interest rate, the inflation rate, and the, in and the interest rate can go positive. Uh, think about China, uh, where uh, the issues around uh, uh, the construction in the rural area becomes a heavy burden, and uh, where uh, clearance is needed. Uh, and I think in many of the developing country emerging economies where uh, uh, debt is higher and this limits their capacity to address issues like uh, global warming, uh, issues like education because uh, they won't have the resources easily in order to finance it. I did want to talk about China and Austria's relationship with China. How, how important do you think ties are between those two nations? I think, I mean, we are small Mickey Mouse compared uh, to, to China, but uh, still, how to say, uh, we are not unimportant for China, and uh, definitely China is important uh, for us. And f I think for the time being, we've been able to um, work well with uh, our comparative advantages. 
Uh, where could you get closer? Well, I, th I think uh, uh, an area where, uh, to say, uh, more exchange uh, could take place could be in the area of energy, because you have, uh, uh, in, 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 in modern energy, you have been now, you're one of the leaders, or China is one of the leaders, or if not the leader in, uh, in the construction of uh, what I care, of windmills and definitely an area. But this is an area we don't only want to import, but also we want to be part of the development and we have something there. Uh, uh, we have uh, in Austria a few uh, automotive uh, companies, the state uh, of the art uh, worldwide. And here we don't only want to deliver our knowledge, we also want how to say uh, to profit from the from the other side, and I think, uh, we, I think where we have uh, had perhaps most of the success is uh, with uh, uh, Chinese tourists when they go to Hallstatt, too many at a time, and so I heard they built now a second Hallstatt in China to, to mimic it now, and I think uh, uh, for China we a little bit of a plastic Disneyland. Uh, but in reality, we're non-plastic non -plastic Disneyland because uh, our environment is really as beautiful as it is. And uh, so we can certainly accommodate a limited number of Chinese tourists uh, and to make them feel happy. And this is what happened in the past. And uh, from what I've seen, they're coming back again. And what about big investment? Um, I'm thinking about um, China's Belt and Road Initiative and you know, that big infrastructure investment scheme. How is that enhancing ties between China and Austria? Well, with regards to big investments uh, here, one has to differ between Austria and perhaps other parts of Europe which don't have it yet. I mean, we have uh, motorways. We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't build more. Uh, we have uh, trains or, and uh, we are building now or we're finishing building two major uh, Dundles, which are open to the south. So in this area, Austria, I don't think, uh, wouldn't need support of uh, what it is. Uh, but uh, here, definitely, uh, 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 what China has been doing is to help some of our neighbors with regard to investments. I hope they're able to pay back the money. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, important for them. I don't say the, the uh, Bell and Road Initiative allows uh, China to come closer by, and uh, this has happened. Well, finally, I'd like to ask you about your economic outlook uh, for, for the rest of the year and uh, I'm moving into um, 2024. Are there reasons for optimism? Uh, yes, I have to say... You uh, hesitated there. No, no, I've guessed that the thing is uh, how, how optimistic I should be. I think there's optimism because what we have here, it's something which I would claim is astonishing that uh, albeit we have a war nearby, a war which uh, consumes quite some resources, which interrupts uh, the life of many people that we're so good, well offer. It's not something which, how to say, it's... Uh, without nothing. But what we also know that this war, if it continues, will t definitely be a dampen, not only to Europe, but the world economy of doing that. So getting rid of this war will be, I think, a major part of it. Also because what they allow them to live up again to the comparative advantages of economies. And this is what makes, how to say, us richer. Not more input, but using our comparative advantage more industriously. Governor Holtzman, thank you very much. My great pleasure, thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming soon on The Agenda, as the world reaches boiling point, are we doing enough to help developing nations fight climate change? But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in Vienna, goodbye.